In this series of videos, we will be discussing orthopedic surgery procedures for the lower limb. And specifically, we'll be focusing on total hip and knee replacement, or arthroplasty, in the greatest detail. These are some of the most frequently performed orthopedic procedures, and ones that you are likely to encounter in the clinical setting. It is interesting to consider the high prevalence of hip replacement surgery in particular among the general population through an anatomical lens. The biological architecture within which we must operate as human beings, our activity throughout the lifespan, and the way in which we use, or perhaps more accurately misuse, that biological architecture during those activities that can ultimately accelerate the degeneration that leads to the need for hip replacement. When it comes to our anatomy, in order to proceed from our boreal ape to upright human, we have evolved some pretty profound changes. For instance, our necks became longer and straighter, and they now join the skull centrally rather than towards the rear, as in other apes. At the back of our heads is another distinguishing feature, the nuchal ligament. This ligament holds the head steady when running, and running is the one thing we do really quite well, compared with our primate cousins. We also have a supple back that bends, outsized knees and angled thigh bones. You may think your legs drop straight down from your waist, like they do in apes, but in fact the femur angles inwards as it descends from pelvis to knee. This has the effect of moving our legs closer together, giving us a much smoother, more graceful gait. We have hips that flare sideways rather than backwards to enable limited frontal plane trunk displacement during gait, and to power our forward motion we have enlarged gluteal muscles and Achilles tendons which stabilize our hips and store energy during gait, respectively. We have arches in our feet for springiness, a sinuous spine to redistribute weight, and reconfigured pathways for our nerves and blood vessels to facilitate thermoregulation. All of these things for the evolutionary imperative of putting our head above our feet whilst allowing us to move about bipedally and efficiently. But bipedalism had consequences that we all live with today as anyone with chronic back pain, hip and knee problems can attest. Coming bipedal meant a wholesale redistribution of our weight across the joints of our lower limbs, and those lower limb joints are highly vulnerable to injury. Every year in the United States, surgeons perform over 800,000 joint replacements, principally of hips and knees, mostly due to the wear and tear on the cartilage lining these joints. It's pretty impressive that cartilage lasts as long as it does, especially when you consider that it cannot repair or replenish itself. Cartilage is many times smoother than glass. It has a friction coefficient five times less than ice. But unlike ice, it isn't brittle. It doesn't crack under pressure. The issue with cartilage is that it isn't nourished by blood. The best thing you can do to maintain cartilage is to move and exercise regularly to keep the cartilage bathed in its own synovial fluid. The worst thing you can do is to live a sedentary lifestyle and progress through the subdivisions of the body mass index by putting on lots of extra weight. For a large proportion of individuals, the most problematic part of their infrastructure, the one that is most prone to joint degradation, is their hips. Hips wear out because they have to do two seemingly incompatible things. They must provide mobility for the lower limbs and they must support the weight of the upper body. This exerts a lot of frictional pressure on the cartilage on both the head of the femur and the hip socket into which it fits. So instead of swiveling smoothly, the two can start to grind painfully, like a pestle in a mortar. The normal hip functions as a ball and socket joint. The femoral head, the ball, articulates with the acetabulum, the socket, allowing a smooth range of motion in multiple planes. Any condition that affects either of these structures can lead to deterioration of the joint. This, in turn, can lead to deformity, pain and loss of function. The most common condition affecting the hip in this way is osteoarthritis. Well into the 1950s, there wasn't anything much medical science could do to relieve the problem of degenerating hips. Complications from hip surgery were so great that the usual procedure was to fuse the hip. This operation relieved the pain but left the person with a permanently stiffened leg. 
Surgical relief was always short-lived because every synthetic material tried would soon wear down until the bones were grinding painfully again. In some cases, the plastics used in hip replacements squeaked so loudly that public embarrassment was common. Sir John Charnley, a British orthopaedic surgeon, devoted himself to solving all the problems with total hip replacement and developed the fundamental principles of the artificial hip. Charnley is credited as the father of total hip arthroplasty. He designed a hip prosthesis in the mid to late 1960s that is still in use today. Essentially, he realised that wear was greatly reduced if the femur was replaced with a stainless steel head and the socket, the acetabulum, was lined with the plastic. Today, total hip arthroplasty is one of the most successful orthopaedic procedures performed. For patients with hip pain due to a variety of conditions, total hip arthroplasty can relieve pain, restore function and improve quality of life. Over 370,000 total hip arthroplasties are performed each year in the United States alone. Total hip arthroplasty is indicated for patients who have failed conservative or previous surgical treatment options for a deteriorated hip joint and who continue to have persistent debilitating pain and a significant decrease in their activities of daily living. Total hip arthroplasty is typically an elective procedure. Thus, a conservative approach aimed at treating the underlying condition should be tried before total hip arthroplasty. For patients with osteoarthritis, this usually includes non-operative treatment measures, such as weight reduction, physical therapy, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, assistive devices, for example a cane, and intraarticular glucocorticoid injections. For patients with inflammatory arthritis of the hip, for example, rheumatoid arthritis or spondyloarthropathy, total hip arthroplasty is offered to address the symptoms of advanced structural disease and not those of the underlying inflammatory disorder, which is treated medically. We will finish this part by reviewing the contraindications of total hip arthroplasty. Total hip arthroplasty should not be undertaken in a number of clinical settings, including where there is active infection, local or systemic, where there are pre-existing significant medical problems, for example, recent myocardial infarction, unstable angina, heart failure, or severe anemia. It shouldn't be performed if the patient is skeletally immature, if the patient is quadriplegic, or if the patient has permanent or irreversible muscle weakness in the absence of pain. The preoperative evaluation is often the first point of contact where an individual suitability for total hip arthroplasty is assessed. When considering the patient's history and physical presentation, most individuals with deterioration of the hip joint present with pain. This is typically localized to the anterior hip or groin. Pain may also be present in the posterior buttock and trochanteric region and can radiate to the thigh or knee. Pain typically occurs with activity but can also be present at rest. The pain is often exacerbated by weight-bearing activities and may be worse with initial movement. Patients frequently describe stiffness or tightness of the hip and loss of motion is often noted. Disruption of sleep and difficulty walking, putting on shoes and socks, going up and down stairs or getting into and out of a car are common complaints. The patient may also need an assistive device like a cane. The preoperative evaluation typically involves inspection of the patient's gait, whether they have a limp or use any assistive device, the skin around the area, including any previous incisions, whether there is any abnormal swelling around the hip or limb, any abrasions, discolorations, or any cutaneous infections. The preoperative evaluation may then progress to palpation of the painful area, which can help rule out non-articular causes of hip pain. Range of motion is typically assessed as limitations of range of motion often develop as hip pathology progresses. Muscle testing should be conducted to determine the strength and tone of the surrounding musculature. That surrounding musculature should be evaluated and documented. Nerve and vascular status should also be assessed. Specifically, sciatic and perineal nerve function testing assessment of arterial pulses, and a sensory examination should be performed and documented for both limbs. Leg length assessment should also be conducted to identify any discrepancies. A deteriorated hip joint may cause a decrease in leg length, 
In most patients, it is desired to achieve equal leg lengths postoperatively. Sometimes, however, surgeons may desire to lengthen a leg beyond the pre-arthritic length to improve hip stability. Tensioning the soft tissues around the hip, for example the hip capsule and abductors, may help reduce the risk of dislocation. Ultimately, however, hip stability is more important than leg length discrepancy. Most surgeons would accept a small leg length inequality in exchange for a hip that is more stable and less likely to dislocate. Total hip prostheses consist of a femoral component, an acetabular component, and a bearing surface. This modularity gives the operating surgeon tremendous flexibility in dealing with any intraoperative situation or anatomical variation. There are a number of femoral and acetabular implants available for use. The choices reflect different philosophies regarding the type of fixation, design features, and materials. The more common approach in the United States achieves fixation without the use of cement and relies on bony ingrowth into or onto the porous implant surface that has been either press fit or interference fit into the surrounding bone. The alternative to a cementless acetabular component is an acetabular component fixed to the acetabulum with cement. This type of acetabular implant has fallen out of favour in the United States due to studies showing a higher overall loosening rate than with uncemented implants. However, some surgeons advocate the use of an all polyethylene cemented acetabular implant for older patients with poor bone quality. Now let's consider the main modules of the hip prosthesis in greater detail. Regarding the femoral component, femoral components can be classified as either cementless or cemented. A cementless femoral component is the implant of choice for younger patients and any patient with good bone stock particularly those with thick femoral cortices and with smaller diameter femoral canals. However, in older patients and those with osteoporosis, it may be more difficult to get good initial stability with the cementless component, and there is a higher risk of periprosthetic femoral fracture. Now let's review the surgical procedure for hip arthroplasty with cement. First, the arthritic head of the femur is exposed, removed completely and shaped for the stem of the stainless steel femoral head replacement. Polymethyl methacrylic cement is applied to the channel created in the femur for the stem. The stem is impacted into the femoral bone, being fixed by the cement, and the head is attached to the stem. In a similar fashion, the acetabulum is shaped, and a polyethylene lining cup is applied to the acetabular shell and fixed with cement. Natural range of motion is replicated by the non-abrasive articulation of the acetabular shell with the metal head of the femur. Next, the cementless approach. As before, the arthritic head of the femur is exposed, removed completely and shaped for the stem of the ceramic femoral head. The replacement stem is impacted into the femoral bone, anchoring the prosthesis, and the head is attached to the stem. The acetabulum is shaped and replaced with a stainless steel acetabular shell. It may or may not be fixed with screws for additional anchorage, but cement is not used in this instance. The polyethylene lining cup is applied to the acetabular shell. Due to the porous nature of the stem metal used, osseointegration stimulates a strong, direct bone metal interface without the need for cement. Natural range of motion is replicated by the non-abrasive articulation of the acetabular shell within the metal head of the femur. In this part, we will review the post-operative care, follow-up and long-term outcomes of patients following total hip arthroplasty. The hospital length of stay following total hip arthroplasty is typically one to three days. However, there are a growing number of surgeons who are now safely performing this procedure without patients. Post-operative management includes pain management, prophylaxis against venous thromboembolism, appropriate attention to medical comorbidities, and physical therapy. When it comes to rehabilitation, many patients can be discharged home after surgery, but some may require a temporary inpatient rehabilitation or nursing facility stay. Mobilization and physical therapy are initiated as soon as possible to facilitate recovery and function and to help prevent deep vein thrombosis, or DVT. Rapid recovery protocols are becoming more widespread. Exercises to restore normal hip motion and strength 
and a gradual return to everyday activities are initiated in the hospital and continued upon discharge. This may involve 20 to 30 minutes of exercises two or three times daily during early recovery. Typically, weight bearing is tolerated as is allowed, and an assistive device is used to help with balance and stability. Walking aids are weaned as strength, balance and comfort improve. Depending on the surgical approach and surgeon's protocol, some patients may need to follow certain dislocation precautions. Some surgeons may also recommend formal outpatient therapy, but this is often individualized based on the surgeon's preferences and the patient's needs. Time to full recovery varies widely, but patients are typically doing quite well with minimal pain by three months post-op. There may be further improvement noted even up to one year following surgery. Most patients may resume regular non-impact activities such as walking, stair climbing, swimming, golf, light tennis and biking. These activities can be resumed once comfort and strength allow. High impact activities such as manual labor, heavy lifting and high intensity sports such as running or jogging should be avoided. And other activities such as yoga and pilates may be allowed if care is taken to avoid extremes in range of motion to avoid dislocation. Long term follow up is recommended to evaluate for wear of the weight bearing surface or other implant related issues. Regarding the longevity of the implant, published results of total hip arthroplasty demonstrate excellent clinical and functional results. Total hip arthroplasty may be performed successfully in patients ranging from young to older adults, those over 80 years of age for example. With modern bearing materials, the risk of revision is as low as 0.5% per year for the first 20 years where data are available. This is true for younger and older patients with only slight increases in risk in younger, more active patients. Patient satisfaction following the procedure is also typically high. In general, over 90% of patients can resume work successfully after total hip arthroplasty, are pain-free, and are without complication 15 years postoperatively. A large meta-analysis, including data from national registries, estimated that almost 60% of hip replacements last 25 years. Most studies show an increased risk of early revision due to infection in obese patients. This effect increases with increasing obesity, particularly with a body mass index, a BMI, of over 35 kilos per square meter in height. Despite the increased risk of revision in obese patients, the risk remains low and obese patients do have significant improvement in post-operative pain, function and satisfaction. Regarding morbidity and mortality, post-operative mortality after total hip arthroplasty is overall low with estimates citing a 30 or 90 day mortality rate of less than 1%. Reductions in mortality rates between 1991 and 2008 were shown in an analysis of over 1.4 million Medicare beneficiaries in the United States who underwent elective primary total hip arthroplasty during this period. And a retrospective analysis from the United Kingdom assessed mortality within 90 days of hip replacement from 2003 to 2011. This study included 409,096 primary hip replacements for osteoarthritis and found that during the eight years of follow-up, there was a significant decrease in mortality from 0.56% to 0.29%, even after adjusting for age, sex and comorbidity. A number of factors are associated with the risk of death after total hip replacement. As an example, mortality rates are higher in patients who have total hip arthroplasty in the setting of hip fracture management when compared with those who have elective surgery for other indications. These risks notwithstanding, the long-term outcomes, morbidity and mortality following total hip replacement are generally excellent. However, a number of alternative procedures are available and one of which will be discussed briefly now. Hip joint resurfacing or hip resurfacing arthroplasty has been posited as a potential alternative technique to total hip replacement. Hip resurfacing arthroplasty preserves the femoral neck and uses a metal prosthesis to replace the femoral head. Enthusiasm for this procedure has diminished secondary to the potential of adverse tissue reactions associated with metal on metal bearings and the concerns about the toxic effects of metal ions.
Although hip resurfacing is still used by some surgeons in highly active young males in whom the results of total hip arthroplasty have been less favourable, there are conflicting data on the durability of joint resurfacing procedures over time. An analysis of long-term data from several national registries found greater rates of re-revision following resurfacing compared with total hip arthroplasty. Finally, we will review some procedures that, due to a lack of clinical evidence, are not warranted and should have no role in the treatment of hip osteoarthritis. Namely, there is no clinical evidence to support joint irrigation in the treatment of hip osteoarthritis, no evidence on the effectiveness of arthroscopic debridement, and no established role for the use of hip arthroscopy in the treatment of advanced OA of the hip. And that concludes this lecture introducing you to hip arthroplasty. In this lecture, we reviewed the background to joint arthroplasty and the role our evolution played in our need to develop these procedures. We then focused on hip replacement, discussed its history, its preoperative valuation, and the procedure for total hip arthroplasty itself. We finished by outlining the post-operative care, follow-up and long-term outcomes of total hip arthroplasty patients, and briefly discussed some of the alternatives to this procedure. This lecture was prepared for students enrolled in the UCD School of Public Health, Physiotherapy and Sports Science. Anatomical images were taken from the complete anatomy software prepared by 3D4 Medical.